Revenge is an ugly word, but for some it is the only chance of healing. This is a story of retribution that lasted for 30 years. Munich, 1972. Millions of viewers around the world tune in to watch the start of the 17th Olympic Games. Thousands of people arrive in the city from all over the world to celebrate another festival of international goodwill. Among them are 28 Israeli athletes, full of optimism and hope. But the Olympics of 1972 will be remembered for something quite different. September the 5th, 4.40 in the morning. Heavily armed terrorists raid the Israeli compound in the Olympic village. Eleven Israeli athletes are killed. Prime Minister Golda Meir informs Parliament of the tragedy. Her response is to form a top-secret committee that will lead a campaign of retribution against those responsible for the Munich Olympic massacre. In the early months of 1972, preparations for the Games were in full swing. Alongside the new sports facilities, new hotels and restaurants were rising all over the city. Elsewhere, other preparations were also in hand. In Lebanon, members of a terrorist organization called Black September, a branch of the Palestine Liberation Organization, were also training for the Olympics. The Palestinians had applied to take part in the games, but because they are not a sovereign state, the letters were never returned. Determined that their voice should be heard, Palestinians decided to contribute in another way. The plans were drawn up here, in Beirut, in January 1972, by four of their leaders. Mahmoud Yusuf Najjar, number three in the PLO and a liaison with Black September. Mohammed Daoud Ude, known as Abu Daoud, an operational planner for the PLO. Ali Hassan Salome, a Black September intelligence operative, nicknamed by the Israelis the Red Prince. And Abu Iyad, head of the PLO intelligence staff and the secret chief of Black September. What they plan is to be seen live by the entire world. At the time, they did not expect it to end in the way that it did. Eric Rulo is a writer and journalist who knew Abu Iyad well. Yes, this is a book which uh, I wrote with Abu Iyad. The book, My Home, My Land, which they wrote together, describes what went on behind the scenes. The Palestinians were humiliated. The Palestinians were desperate. I think that Black September was one of a means of keeping up the morale of the Palestinian militants. And making such a big operation like Munich would give the PLO, would give the Palestinians uh, some kind of respect for what they are doing. The whole world also would discover that the Palestinians are still there, they have to deal with them. They were hoping to succeed. They, not, they were not going to harm the athletes, they were going to take them to Algiers. It would be a big success for the PLO. In order to succeed, they need a lot of information about the Olympic village. And for this, they need local help. In the summer of 1972, Black September contacts the Red Army Faction, or RAF, a German terrorist group. In August, the RAF begins monitoring security around the Olympic Village, supplying Black September with pictures of targets and details of routines.
Willy Voss, a former neo-Nazi, was an RAF activist at the time. We made a contract that the Palestinians would help us and we would give them the chance to do their operations in Europe. I gave information to people who stand in Europe, Palestinian people. I took information, I gave money, I took money, I brought weapons, and everything uh, an organization like that needs. ארגוני הטרור בעולם של שנות ה-60, ה-70 וה-80, אחד הדברים שמאוד אפיינו אותם זה הקשרים ההדוקים ביניהם, בין ארגונים שלכאורה לא, לא היה ביניהם שום דבר משותף. אם זה ארגון גרילה אורבני בדרום אמריקה, ארגון בסקי שמנסה להשיג עצמאות לחבל ארץ בספרד, אנשי בדר מיינהוף, וכמובן הפלסטינים, שבשלב זה או אחר שאפו להקים מדינה משלהם. וכל הארגונים האלה, למרות שבעצם לא היה להם שום דבר משותף, יצרו אידיאולוגיה משותפת של מאבק למען זהות לאומית, למען בית לאומי, נגד מה שהם ראו ככוח כובש או כוח אימפריאליסטי, ובאופן טבעי התחילה מעין בורסה של שמור לי ואשמור לך. September the 5th, Black September strikes. At 4.40 in the morning, a group of hooded figures enter the Olympic village. They move systematically through the buildings, scanning the hallways in search of Israeli athletes. By dawn, Black September's agents have captured nine Israelis, killing one at the break-in and another as he tries to fight back. In a matter of minutes, the terrorists have taken control of the Israeli compound. They threaten the German authorities with a bloody massacre if their instructions are not followed. Esther Shachamorov, a sprinter in the Israeli team, was in the women's quarters. I remember it was a pain. I remember that we came out of the building and we went to the building for us to bring us to another building. We looked at it all the time and we said, maybe in any place we were waiting for us to be able to do it. There was a feeling of pain. וגם כן חוסר ודאות. In Israel, Golda Meir wakes up to the news at home in Jerusalem. She was shocked. It was one of the most shocking experiences in our history. For Golda, this is more than another act of terrorism. The murder of Jews on German soil brings back memories of the Holocaust still vivid in her mind. She is perceived as the Jewish mother of the Israeli people, and she feels it her duty to defend her children. Revenge is the only option. The immediate question that stood before us, can we send a unit from, here, from Israel to Germany in order to release the Sportsman. Golda Meir calls in Tzvi Zamir, head of Israel's Central Institute for Intelligence and Security, a secret organization known around the world by the Hebrew word for institute, Mossad. She also summons Aharon Yariv, head of military intelligence, to discuss the possibility of a rescue operation. All along the day, uh, there were uh, here uh, a lot of in intensive uh, consideration what, what should be done. Ehud Barak, later Israel's prime minister, commanded a combat unit at the time. I was at the time the commander of our elite unit that was more trained than any other unit here and probably in the world at the time. In one in such uh, operations, we already had behind us rescue operation of a uh, hijacked Sabina airplane at Ben Gurion airport. And, and I suggested to General Yariv, who was at the time the head of intelligence, telling him, look, I, we are prepared 
to take our unit, uh, put a, a plane, it will be there, and until night we can fall on our feet very quickly and adapt to the situation and, and be able to, probably be able to uh, execute an, a rescue operation. We send the head of our Mossad to Germany to check the possibilities. The Germans thought that they can handle it. The idea of Zviga Zemir was, in other words, to check out the Germans, 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 that we are going to do this. We are already in the Kornanut, we are 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 in the Kornanut. At 2.30 that afternoon, Mossad chief Zvi Zemir lands in Munich and is immediately taken to Kornolistrasse, where the hostages are held. He comes with a message from Golda Meir, who offers help to the Germans. As the media gather outside the building, the terrorists issue their demands. They provide a typewritten list of 234 Palestinian and German prisoners to be released. Among them, Ulrike Meinhof and Andreas Bader, founders and leaders of the notorious Bader-Meinhof gang. In Israel, the reaction of the public is horror and despair. The entire country tunes in to events in Munich as they unfold. The Germans are not ready to accept Israeli assistance. Zamir reports this to Golda Meir. This is the original coded letter that he sent her on September the 5th. But Golda refuses to negotiate with terrorists. She will accept nothing but total surrender. By late evening, the terrorists demand to be taken to the airport with their hostages. This gives the Germans a chance to launch a rescue operation. As they reach the airport, the police strike, but they lose control. The terrorists panic, open fire and throw a hand grenade. As the smoke clears, all nine Israeli hostages lie dead and five terrorists. Three terrorists survive and are arrested by the Germans. The world reacts with horror to this act of barbarism. There is a move to cancel the games, but this is widely seen as conceding victory to the terrorists. After a memorial ceremony, the games continue without the Israeli team. They choose to return home. They have lost 11 of their friends. Esther Shachamarov has lost her personal trainer. <laughs> חוזר באווירון, הוא הביא אותך לשם, זאת אומרת, אנחנו באנו ביחד, ואני יושבת באווירון, ואני יודעת שהוא למטה בארון. What started out in an atmosphere of reconciliation and hope has ended in a bloody massacre. But Golda Meir is determined to settle the score. As the nation mourns, Golda Meir assembles the heads of Israel's intelligence to form a top secret team whose mission will be to terrorize the terrorists. It is to be known as Committee X, and its leader is General Acharon Yariv. Yariv believes in quiet action executed without the help of the international community. The international uh, community did not take a strong stand at that time against terrorist activity and did not take decisive action against terrorists even when they captured terrorists. Many of terrorists who were captured red-handed in dust at their attacks were let go free. As if to prove Yariv's point, less than two months after the massacre, the Palestinians hijack a Lufthansa flight at Munich itself, demanding the release 
of the three surviving perpetrators. The German authorities give in. It is clear that Israel will have to act alone. Under Committee X, Mossad sets up a special unit of agents that will hunt down and kill every person involved in the Munich attack, one by one. The trauma was so big that there was an absurd thing. The Israel that killed the death of the death, there was no death in the Israeli law, except for Nazis and the members of the Nazis. And because of the trauma of Minchen, the Israel decided to get to the end but within Mossad, it is agreed that this time killing the operatives is justified. I think there is a lot of um, logic to do it, because if you don't do it, these same people will continue to cause the death of innocent people. So in a way, you are saving lives by doing it. So although I, I personally am dead against, for example, um, summary executions of, 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 um, of murderers and things like that, but if you have a case where you can save lives and you know that these people will continue to kill, then you have to take drastic action. If, if we can allow uh, Israelis or Jews to become targets all around the world, you know, it, it cuts underneath somehow the way that Israel uh, perceives itself and the, the raison d'etre of having Israel as a shelter. If as a result of having this shelter, uh, Jews all around the world or Israel is at a higher risk it, uh, without any kind of uh, capacity to, to respond, uh, that would uh, give uh, the, the wrong signal to the uh, terrorists. In Tel Aviv, Mossad begins to gather information on the terror group responsible for the massacre. Golda is kept informed every step of the way. Personal dossiers are assembled for each of the terrorists. At the top of the hit list of 12 known terrorists is Ali Hassan Salami. The Red Prince has eluded Mossad before, but this time they mean to eliminate him. From its stations around the world, their intelligence sources provide Mossad with valuable data on Black September, its personnel, weapons, and financing. Recruiting agents among terror organizations is one of the most difficult things to do because terrorists are usually very motivated. They usually operate in small groups, um, and it's very, very difficult to find someone in those small groups who is willing to um, betray his comrades and his ideals and to talk. But I can tell you that we certainly did succeed. By October 1972, Committee X has produced a heavy file on Black September. Black September was born in Jordan in 1970. The capital, Amman, had become the headquarters of Fatah, the military wing of the PLO. I was in Amman just before the war broke out between the Fedayeen and the Jordanian army. And all the journalists, we had about 700 journalists there, we were convinced that if there was a war, the Fedayeen would win. They looked so strong, they were in the streets, when we arrived at the airport, there was nobody from the Jordanian government to receive the journalists. It was the representative of Fatah who came and gave us press cards, uh, told us which hotel to go. They were acting like a government. From Jordan, the Palestinians were conducting their campaign against Israel and working to bring their cause to the attention of the world. In September 1970, they hijack three airliners to the Jordanian desert. After removing all the passengers, they put on a firework display for the world to watch.
For King Hussein of Jordan, this is a step too far. Well, actually, the hijackings, as far as I was concerned, were uh, uh, this throw that broke the camel's back. Uh, something had to be done. And uh, the humiliation of having uh, aircraft flown into uh, the country and innocent passengers being whisked away to uh, uh, various parts of uh, the country and being unable to do anything about it and subsequently having this aircraft blown up uh, was something that uh, questioned whether Jordan really existed or whether it didn't. Hussein's army launches all-out war on Jordan's refugee camps. A bloodbath follows as thousands of Palestinians are killed and tens of thousands are wounded. Many of the Palestinians are expelled, forced to relocate to run-down camps in South Lebanon. The PLO changes its address to Beirut. From the ashes of the burning camps, a new and vicious terror group is born to live under the PLO's umbrella. In commemoration of the recent tragic events, it will be called Black September. In Tel Aviv, Golda Meir chooses a veteran Mossad agent to command the assassination team. He will operate independently with no official link to Israel. His name is Mike Harari, an intelligence agent for 20 years with a reputation for extreme ferocity. Mike Harari chooses Paris as his headquarters, settling there under the alias of French businessman Edouard Lasky. He hand-picks his team of assassins. Much like the terrorist cells in Europe, Harari assigns separate tasks to small groups. They will act independently. Mike Harari kibel oraa, ta tekabel reshima shel anashim shayu achraim yeshirot la tevach b'minchen va ta tidag lechach shehem לא ימותו מוות טבעי. וזאת בהחלט, זה רגע מאוד מכריע, לא רק בתולדות מדינת ישראל, אלא גם בתולדות הטרור הבינלאומי. מכיוון שזאת פעם ראשונה שמדינה סוברנית בעצם נטלה על עצמה לפעול על פי אותם, אותו קנה מידה ובאותם כלים של ארגוני הטרור, ובעצם, אם אפשר לומר, לפעול כארגון מאפיה. אתה בא לחסל אותי, אני אחסל אותך. October 1972, one of Harari's teams arrives in Rome. Its first target is Abdel Wahel Zueta, a Palestinian poet working as a translator at the Libyan embassy. He lives quietly on Piazza Annibaliano. Mossad suspects that as the Black September representative in Rome, Zueta was involved in the logistical organization of the Munich operation. October the 16th, 1972, 10.30 in the evening. Zueta returns home from work. Behind the door, a figure waits in the shadows. 11 bullets are fired into his body, one for each of the slain athletes. He dies instantly. Golda Meir receives the message, number one is down. The Italian police find the shells to be from a Beretta pistol, the weapon of choice of Mossad agents, the gun which will become their calling card. December 1972, Paris. Dr. Mahmoud Hamshari, the PLO spokesman in France, lives at number 175 Rue d'Alesia. This is a clip from his last television interview. Une dernière question. Est-ce que vous pouvez vivre tranquille en France? Est-ce que vous ne craignez pas pour votre vie? Pour nous, pour moi, non. Mais je pense qu'il faut pas tenter le diable. Hamshari is next on the list. Because of his job, Hamshari is used to meeting journalists from around the world. In December, a man posing as a journalist requests an interview. 
What Han Shari fails to realize is that this journalist is an agent of Mossad. During the interview, the agent surveys his apartment. He meets Han Shari's French wife and his daughter, collecting as much information as he can. The next day, the undercover agent watches the house from a cafe across the street. He waits for Hamshari's wife and daughter to leave before making a phone call. When Hamshari answers, a radio signal activates a bomb planted in the receiver. Hamshari is severely wounded. A month later, he dies. Three weeks later, Harari sends another team to Nicosia, Cyprus. Hussein Abad al the PLO's major contact with the Soviets, is next on the list. Golda needs to make it clear that her revenge will reach the perpetrators, wherever they may try to hide. At 10 o'clock in the evening, he returns to his hotel room after a meeting at the Russian embassy. As he lies down on his bed, a pressure bomb planted underneath it kills him instantly. Alkhir is buried in Cyprus. In the months that follow, Harari's team identifies almost every major Black September operative working undercover in Europe. April 1973 marks the peak of Mossad's activity against Black September. Paris, Friday, April the 6th, 1973. Law professor Basil Alcubezi is seen leaving the Café de la Paix near the opera. Alcubezi makes his way home. As he reaches Rue de l'Arcade, he is confronted by two men who fire 11 bullets into his body. Alcubezi was number five. The French police can only guess from the Beretta shells found at the scene that this was the work of Mossad. But on Golda's instructions, Israel denies any involvement in any of the killings. The world knew it was Mossad. So did Black September. The continuing killings put each and every member on their guard. In Beirut, Abu Iyad, the mastermind of the Munich operation, revealed his feelings to Eric Rulo. We spent many nights talking. Uh, I suspected that she was, in one way or another, involved in Black September, but I didn't know that she was the head of it. This I realized after talking with him. He, didn't, he never admitted it. Uh, it was too dangerous. Since the Munich operation, he was living in fear. He told me so. Retribution on European soil is not enough. Prime Minister Golda Meir orders Committee X to pursue everyone on the list, including those who are hiding in enemy countries. Mossad, the Mat Europa, Chesel, all Mechabel, all Mufaked, Chesolim in Rome and in Paris, these Chesolim that could be used to the Mossad, be there and rag them. And then it appears that there is a media of the Russian Mechablim, of the Sgat of Yasser Arafat, of Yusuf Najjar, who is a Mufaked ושהוא גם מהמתכננים של הפעולה במינכן, ברור לגמרי שצריך לחסל אותו. עכשיו, המוסד ב- ב- בארץ יד, יותר קשה לו לבצע מאשר אדמת אירופה. לכן הוחלט שעושים כאן מבצע משולב למעשה, משותף. המודיעין מגיע מהמוסד, יסיר אותנו המוסד, ואנחנו נבצע את המשימה. the uh, Mossad people about what kind of information might be needed in order to decide whether an operation to be carried out by us is possible. And we said that it will be almost impossible to uh, plan a, a decisive, very short um, attack if we cannot learn a little bit about the structure the internal structure of these apartments. And it ended up that we were given the uh, almost full plan of the, of the building, from, uh, from the basement to, to the top floors with the internal arrangements that were found to be quite accurate of 
what's going uh, within the apartment, and some more information about the routines. On April the 10th, they all meet in Golda's office to lay the plan before her. With her approval, the operation will proceed. On the evening of April the 11th, 1973, Operation Springtime of Youth begins. Supported by the Navy, a special commando unit makes its way towards the shores of Lebanon. Mossad agents are waiting for them on the beach to drive the commandos to their target. של <laughs> I was uh, kind of uh, in modern clothes with uh, everything in place, and uh, I was a, I, I was a brunette, and I had a stocky blonde besides me, and two other uh, blondes entered into the building with the squad. They are to raid an apartment block in the heart of Beirut. Three high-ranking Black September officers are living there. The commandos raid the building, killing the three members of Black September. Several innocent people are also killed in the crossfire. The operation is swift. Having created havoc in the city, the commandos move quickly back to their boats. 30 minutes after we landed, we were back in the sea and uh, we were uh, back home. They came back home. I couldn't tell my wife, uh, then wife at the time, what exactly I'm going to uh, do that night. And I fell asleep uh, just before dawn in our bed. She uh, woke up in the morning and saw a little bag near the bed with woman dress, which were not hers. <laughs> then we, she came closer. She could see still remnants of uh, lipstick and uh, no, uh, mascara and the blue under the eyes. Uh, you can imagine what passed in her mind. But what, The raid is a massive blow to Black September. It causes the death of Mohammed Yusuf Najjar, number three in the PLO, Black September's leader, Kemal Adwan, and Kamal Nasser, a spokesman for the PLO. Yasser Arafat demands that the world condemn the action. In Athens the next morning, Musa Abu Ziad hears the news of the attack in his rented room. He is another one on the list of Munich conspirators. Abu Ziad rushes out to buy a newspaper. While he is out, Mossad agents enter his room and plant a plastic explosive charge under the bed. Minutes later, Abu Ziad is killed. The hit list grows ever shorter. With the elimination of the Beirut headquarters, Ali Hassan Salameh, the Red Prince, moves up in the rankings of the PLO. 
For Harari, catching Salome becomes a top priority. While some in Israel call for the killings to stop, Harari is determined finally to cross the name of the Red Prince from the list. Norway, July 1973. Mossad agents receive a tip that Salome has gone to ground in the city of Lillehammer. Harari travels to Norway to command the operation himself. He has two teams, one of logistical planners and the hit team. The agents quickly locate their target, leaving a local theater accompanied by a blonde woman. The man's features resemble those of Salome and his attraction to blondes fits the profile compiled by Mossad. The assassins follow the couple as they travel home. They ambush their victim, shooting him at close range, only to discover that they have killed the wrong man. Ahmed Boucheki, a Moroccan waiter whose only crime is to resemble Salome, is shot dead in broad daylight in front of his pregnant Norwegian wife. Harari and the assassin just managed to escape. The Norwegian police arrest six Mossad operatives connected with the shooting. They are sentenced to long terms of imprisonment. עבד בצורה מאוד חובבנית, הם בלטו מיד והם עשו את עבודתם כמו פיל בחנות חרסינה. הפעולה בליל האמר מעבר לכישלון המבצעי גרמה למוסד לאסון נוראי מבחינת חשיפה. מה שקרה הוא שבגלל הפעילות המאוד רשלנית של אותה חוליה, חלק נתפס. ואז הסתבר לחוקרים הנורבגיים שאחד העצורים מוכן לדבר רק בתנאי שלא יחזיקו אותו בתא סגור. שוב, זה סיפור שמראה את ה... אולי את, ה... את הפן הטרגי של כל הפעילות החשאית של מדינת ישראל. אותו איש, דן ארבל, כך הופיע שמו בתקשורת מאוחר יותר, גדל כנער בדנמרק הכבושה על ידי הנאצים, והוא הסתתר תקופה ארוכה במלחמת העולם השנייה בתוך ארון, פיתח קלסטרופוביה. עובדה שלא הייתה ידועה למעבידיו כאשר הצטרף לשירות הביון הישראלי כישראלי שנים רבות אחר כך. וכאשר הוא נעצר בעקבות פרשת לילהמר, הוא הוכנס לכלא, והמעמסה הנפשית עליו הייתה כה גדולה, שהוא אמר לחוקרים, אני אספר לכם הכל. רק אל, ת, אל, 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 אל תשאירו אותי בתא סגור. The failure exposes Mossad's actions in Europe. Golda Meir immediately recalls Harari to Israel. The operational disaster in Norway sends shockwaves through the international community, placing Israel in an extremely tight spot. התקלה של אילהאמר גרמה לעצירה, כי א' נחשפנו, הם נתפסו, זה היה משפט, המשפט הזה והעובדה שישראל מבצעת מבצעים אדמת אירופה, והיה ברור לכולם שמה שבוצע עד אז, זה לא בין מחבלים ובין כנופיות ובין ארגונים, אלא היה ברור מי מבצע את זה. גולדה קורס את המוסד אג'נט שלהם, לא רק מאירופה, אלא גם מאירופה אחרת. הפעילות של הססנטים היא נכון לעשות. המוסד לא יכול להיות עוד פיאסקו. Golda Meir remains Prime Minister until 1974, when she is succeeded by Yitzhak Rabin. On December the 8th, 1978, Golda Meir dies. Thousands come to pay their last respects to their Jewish mother. But despite her departure, her legacy of revenge lives on. Her successors will not rest until Golda's list is completed.
In 1979, Mossad reorganizes and refocuses on the Red Prince, directing more resources towards his elimination. Ali Hassan Salame has evaded the Israeli secret agents in Europe for years. He leads a luxurious life with the salary of a high-ranking PLO activist and a new wife, the 1971 Miss Universe from Lebanon. By 1979, the Red Prince and his wife Georgina have settled down in Beirut, though Salome continues to have an eye for other women. I met him once or twice, but I didn't like mixing with him because I knew he was, he was a killer, Salame, Hassan Salame. Hassan Salame is the, uh, probably one of the great killers of the PLO. I mean, I didn't like him very much. He was a playboy. You would see him on the beaches of uh, Beirut, uh, very well dressed, with a lot of women around him. I mean, he was uh, quite a figure. Uh, the way his lifestyle made him antipathic, made him uh, not likable by the Palestinians who were living a hard life. And, he had a lot of money. Nobody knew where money was coming from. He was spending in, in cabarets. And... Some say the money comes from America. Salome has very good relations with the CIA. He might be their top agent in Lebanon. This relationship enables Salome to boost the Palestinian cause and to promote Arafat in the international arena. He was, uh, it seems that he was uh, very uh, smart and that he was having an excellent relationship with the CIA, probably giving them things which they wanted. I mean, he knew how to deal with them. And the Israelis were frightened of this because they were afraid that he would turn the Americans on the side of the Palestinians. That was the real reason why they hated him. Ali Hassan Salame, בגלל שהוא היה ראש מפקד ספטמבר השחור, בגלל הטראומה הנמשכת של טבח מינכן, הוחלט בביון הישראלי שלמרות השנים הרבות שעברו, הוא טסט קייס, כלומר פה יש עניין ליוקרה הישראלית. אם חיסלו את כל סגניו, את כל העוזרים שלו, עד האחרון האפסנאים, אין שום סיבה שלא לרוצץ את ראשו של הנחש. Israeli intelligence, aware of his weakness for women, sets a honey trap. Erika Chambers, an agent sent by Mossad, meets Salome as if by chance. She is an attractive woman and he is immediately smitten. They have a passionate affair, during which Chambers closely observes Salome and reports on his daily routine. The agents rent a Volkswagen and load it with explosives. They park the car near Erica's apartment. Ali Hassan Salama, Abu Hassan, was martyred on the path of the revolution and liberation. At 4, at 4 p.m. Monday, January 22nd, together with four of his escorts, Utah I removed the donated explosive charge. The Red Prince, one of the key planners of the Munich massacre, is dead. The Central Committee of Fatah and the PLO while notifying the murderdom of the militant leader Abu Hassan, in charge of the special operation branch, which used to hit and chase the Zionist enemy wherever they were, affirms that the murderers, the murderers will not escape the punishment of the revolution. In May 1988, 16 years after Munich, as Israel celebrates its 40th anniversary, another of the conspirators, Abu Jihad, is murdered in Tunisia. Mossad is believed to be responsible. No one knows how many names were on the list compiled by Committee X, but the assassinations continued into the 90s. Today, more than three decades after the Munich massacre, 
Most of the terrorists involved in the attack have been killed by Mossad. Golda has kept her promise. In fact, she kept her word, with two exceptions, I would say. Abu Daoud, who actually said that she was in it. Abu Daoud lives uh, quite normally in Amman. He travels, and the Israelis didn't, never tried to kill him. Why? I don't know. And Abu Yad, I'm sure that uh, the Israelis knew that Abu Yad was the head of Black September. I, don't, I can't imagine that I was the only one to suspect it. Uh, they never tried to kill him. Abu Iyad, the head of Black September and the mastermind behind the Munich attack, was later murdered in Tunisia by his Palestinian opponent, Abu Nidal. Abu Daoud lives on as the only survivor of Golda's revenge. The painful memories of Munich have not faded, nor have the wounds been healed by the retribution. Both sides bear many newer scars from the cycle of violence that has continued since.